Expansion packs are hard to get right. We already know this from the fucking hilariously bad attempts known as let's break another chunk off the sims so we can charge money for it. Sometimes they associate expansion packs with developers running out of money spending on Death Stars and Natsu memorabilia and need a few extra quid. Maybe my cynical attitude is a product of shitty expansions over the last couple of years. For example, Dead Island Riptide. This game was a separate game from the first so they could stick a full price sticker on the front but almost nothing has changed. The map changes slightly, along with a few other weapons but I doubt that map is very difficult to make. It's a jungle with a few buildings and rocks. But even the type of mechanics that professional reviewers and critics blasted it still remains. Like the absurd kicking mechanic that can't be interrupted and stunlocks enemies and makes them fall over while you aimlessly kick at their fucking face like some yobbo. And at the other end of the shitty expansion pack spectrum comes WoW's Mr. Pandaria. Where Blizzard added too much newbie friendly material and pandas, it just made everything feel childish. Chimps are the more dark storylines for how pandas are cuddly and cute and it just all seems stupid. It's hard to take a game seriously when it intentionally tries to be childish. Maybe Blizzard had their arm bent round their back by their tyrannical overlord who have been spitting out the same shitty generic FPS clone for 10 years, but I digress. It's a rare sight to behold, an expansion pack that's executed with the right amount of content that it can be considered fresh and new, without changing too many things that makes it feel like another game altogether. Of course, I bring myself onto my main subject, Civilization V Brave New World. And let's address the question directly, is it a good value for money? Well, listen to what I have to say and behold my opinion. I very much enjoyed the espionage element of this game. The only slight criticism I have of this mechanic is why did it take so long? for it to appear in Civilization? Why did it take an expansion pack for it to appear when it seems like it should be in the very core part of Civilization Consider that espionage is a very large element of modern day society? Overlooking this of course, espionage complements Civilization V Brave New World very well. It feels very fresh and new and it's not implemented sloppily, it's executed with some sort of depth. Adding new buildings which can increase your chance of detecting enemy spies and your spies become more experienced as they steal technologies from other people. Just so you know, I had to wait 150 turns to acquire a free technology from using this espionage element. But it's a big payoff. It can help you get ahead of your enemies while with technology rather than brute force. Using this to your advantage can provide you with more powerful military than your opponent despite only having 4 soldier units. Depending on how developed your nation is, meaning what area it's in, depends on the amount of spies you can recruit and send on their devious excursions. In the information age, which is the last era, you can have five or six spies. I exploited this element because I had the game on very hard, and taking over civilization with all-out war seems foolish, especially when your soldiers can drain your economy dry before you know it, your populace hates you and plots to overthrow you. So you really need a strong economy before you throw your weight around in a two 178 year war. I love, love this about this game though, strategy. Civilization hits the nail on the head with this phase. By dictionary definition, strategy means you have to use your head to accomplish your goals. I found this really did have to use my head on very hard difficulty and there was a challenge around every corner. The immersiveness is what drives me to praise this game. Stealing technologies off other nations eventually makes them declare war on you, but by that time they do you are like 13 technologies ahead, so you, their soldiers are chucking rocks and you mow them down where they stand. Another element which I welcome with open arms is World Congress. Brilliant added feature, one of my favourite by far. Let me explain for you how it works. The first person to enter the industrial era becomes the, era, becomes the host nation for the World Congress and you immediately discover all nations when the World Congress is set up. So other unmet nations no longer say unmet player 5 in my game. Portugal were the almighty ruler of World Congress because they beat me to one turn, the fuckers. Despite this, I jumped into it with passion for hatred of the city-states, issued a decree to embargo all city-states. Let me just let you know now, I hate city-states. They're obnoxious, pretentious dickheads, and they do nothing other than taunt you and wind you up throughout the whole game. Different city-states can have different characterization, but they still, I still hate all of them. In every game I've played, they've never liked me for long. Your decree can only pass if many nations agree to it. You can send your delegates to World Congress to support your decree and friendship with city-states gives you more delegates. So I had about one delegate from my own nation. It's not likely that many city-states will give me delegates when I plan to embargo their nations. But I hope my delegates would per persuade more nations to hate city-states, thus my city-state genocide begins. After a set amount of time, every nation votes for the new almighty World Congress leader. I always vote for myself, but never really got it. 
All in all, this element gives the game a certain amount of sophistication, making you actually feel like a powerful nation and that you have some swing and leverage in, your, in the civilization world, making it feel more enticing though that you would never control a nation in your monotonous life. Another added element which proves itself useful is ideologies. When you hit modern age or build free factories for some reason, you get to decide your country's ideology, despite having a little bit of slight lack of choice, I decide to go order which is communism for all you morons who don't know. And my populace hated me for every second from the first term I even implemented it. Implemented it. it works like this. You have three choices, order, freedom, autocracy, hence why I said slight lack of choice. You can't go for the middle like socialism or, uh, or fashion or whatever. You pick one and you get three subsections, each with about five to eight sections that traits can be added. You get your first tier traits, which are the easiest to acquire and have the least amount of impact, but you but if you generate a lot of culture, which I find really hard to do, you can unlock the second tier and third tier so your traits have a lot more impact on your nation. I never made it to the third tier of traits. I don't understand how to generate a lot of culture and no matter what it, I do, it stays the same anyway. Although this feature is useful and can give you some good buffs, you have to be playing it for a very long time to acquire some of the best traits and picking traits in ideology takes up culture so you can't pick policies as well as ideologies. So you have to be clever in traits that you want at that time because some are very situational. Don't get me wrong, I like this, but I find it quite difficult to get the balance right between policies and ideologies. The AI in this game are fantastic. You can even set the game so they generate a personality rather than having set personalities. So they can either act like a knobhead or they can love you. I had this with Portugal. Portugal was my neighbour and we had pretty good relations and I traded with a lot of their cities because they were rich as fuck and Greece didn't like me whatsoever because they had generated a personality that just hated me and they declared war on me in the industrial era I worried because my nation was really poor and theirs was extremely rich and they had a massive army but they were far away from me I set the map to earth on huge and I had central Europe I owned all the way from France to the Baltic states if you don't know geography fucking looking at Atlas and Greece occupied South Africa onwards. Their ground troops never really made it to my nation, but their ships really bugged at me by destroying my trading vessels and blowing raspberries at my cities from the ocean. Portugal, being as courageous and cool as they are, declared war on Greece and destroyed all the ships that were harassing me and breaking my trade lines. I assumed that Portugal declared war on Greece because I was trading with them and Greece kept destroying my trade ships, but you never really know. It could have been any reason that AI might not have been programmed for this. They could have declared war on them because they felt like it, but I'll just give the AI the benefit of the doubt. It's masterfully programmed and it did make me feel grateful that they helped. Great people. There are a handful of new great people in Civilization Brave Rail. This includes great writer, great artist and great musician. All of these can contribute to a culture ending or victory. It's a neat touch how you can create buildings such as galleries so that your great people can create a great work which you can put in the gallery or an equivalent of a gallery for a musician or writer. It adds depth to the game, not only this, but you can if you get into a war, and you will, you will have to be mindful to move great works because if your enemy captures the city where your great works are in, he now owns that, subsequently contributing to his culture rather than yours. Of course you can take the city back but your enemy will probably move it, the dick. There are a few other things that pe great people can do. A great musician can host a rock show or whatever and can generate tourism for that tile. And this can only be performed when it's not in your tile for some reason. I would have thought that the great musician can host a rock show for his home nation and not other nations, but whatever. The great writer can write a piece of, um, I don't know, writing <laughs> when you're in when in your nation's tile and generate an absurd amount of culture. I think it was 800 when I did it. But if you're like me and your cities have less culture than city of Glasgow, it seems like a lot. So for me, this has been quite a long review and I've taken a lot of time to review this game because I know how masterfully created these type of games are. I played it for a week before I wrote this and covered all the points that I feel were important or fresh in some way. To sum this game up, it's an add-on to Civilization V, but a good type of add-on add -on, you know where they actually add stuff on. Executed well and doesn't change any core mechanics that makes it feel like it, it isn't its own game. But with a few other things, it has sophistication and depth to it and you can have a lot of fun with this game. So to ac address the question directly, is it worth your money? I will answer that with another question. Do you like turn-based strategy games which are masterfully created and have a good immersion factor? There's your answer. I'm Cal. Thanks for watching.